School of Global Policy and Strategy, also known as DCS. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's event, and thank you for attending the Water and West Roundtable. I'm Wendy Hunter-Barker, I'm an Assistant Dean at GPS. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with our school, we are the UC System's only professional school for international affairs. We offer a variety of master's degrees in um, international relations and this, uh, public policy. And our faculty are experts on all things touching the Pacific Rim and beyond. We have a strong focus on quantitative study, and our faculty work across the campus with our STEM partners to combine their multidisciplinary expertise with the goal of creating well-informed, practical policy options. As a means of furthering campus collaboration, we created the Science Policy Fellows Program. Through this program, a GPS faculty member is paired with a PhD student in a STEM field. They guide that student as they explore the policy implications of their research. We're in our third year, and we have three amazing fellows, all of whom are here tonight, and they represent the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, Jacobs School of Engineering, and the School of Medicine. As a further testament to our desire to work across campus, this event is co-sponsored by Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Scott Sellers to welcome you on behalf of Scripps. Thank you very much, Assistant Dean Parker. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure working with you and your team. Uh, we greatly appreciate your leadership in uh, making this event happen. So, hello, everyone. My name is Scott Sellers. I'm a postdoctoral scholar uh, at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Uh, Scripps is a leading institution on research in the oceans, the atmosphere, and the climate system. Uh, I founded the Scripps Science Policy Discussion Group to uh, bring together our diverse community of faculty, staff, and students to discuss policy relevant topics. Uh, we are a small group in our first year, um, but we uh, are looking forward to the future to encourage further discussions. Tonight's great panel is intended to do just that and to bring together our different communities to discuss the important topic such as water in the West. But we'd like to thank uh, the Scripps Director's Office for providing uh, catering, so please enjoy uh, the food and uh, the drink. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Uh, Mar Marty Ruff. Thank you, Dr. Sellers and Barton. We're uh, very pleased, pleased to be here. Thanks for everybody coming tonight. Uh, my name is Marty Ralph. I'm a researcher at Scripps Oceanography. And I'll be giving you a few words here in a moment on uh, what I'm working on. But my background is in meteorology and atmospheric science. And I joined Scripps three years ago to work on problems related to water and extreme events in the western US. I found that as a NOAA person, where I was for 20 years, there was a lot of attention given to problems elsewhere in the country. It was much harder to get uh, attention on the problems we really have to face here, particularly around water. Having come from Michigan and Florida and spent a lot of time in DC, uh, it's a very different world out here than it is there. So it's a great pleasure to be here tonight, and I want to uh, also welcome our panelists and give them a brief introduction here. Uh, first, we have uh, Sandy Kerr, Curl, Sandy Curl from San Diego County Water Authority, and she's the Deputy uh, General Manager uh, covering finance, operations and maintenance, and engineering, uh, as well as water supply. It's a really uh, heavy position to be in, especially in a drought-prone environment, so thanks for your tough work on that. I can't imagine the trade-offs that you have to do with them. Um, she has a background in uh, political science from San Luis Obispo, Cal Poly, and also an MBA uh, from Redlands. Uh, she also was lead uh, of the project team for the Carlsbad desal project, desalinization project, one of the unique and very important capabilities now established for Southern California. Controversial in some ways, but vital, I believe, for our long-term well-being. So thanks for your work on that. We also tonight have the pleasure of uh, Dr. Jen Burney, uh, assistant professor at uh, GPS. We just got the introduction there. Um, and Dr. Burney came from an interesting background. She uh, has physics in her background and has a PhD from Stanford. So thanks for coming south to where things are really fun. <laughs> I'm serious about that. I just moved from Colorado. It's really sweet here. Although a little chilly tonight, I have to say. I don't know if anybody else is cold. I'm getting acclimated. I'm getting soft. But uh, 
Professor Bernie has, uh, has uh, taken her physics background and, and brought her attention to climate. Something got her interested in climate some time ago, and she's really poured the coals to that and has a lot of work and interest in air, uh, air pollution problems, which I have to say from my own experience was a really big deal. I went to UCLA for grad school, got my PhD there uh, back in 1843, I think it was. <laughs> it's been a longer than I'd like. But, um, the air pollution there was really profoundly bad, even in the early 80s. And I had heard it had gotten a little better from the 70s. And now, I take my children to LA, it's amazing how clear the air is relative to what it was. I'm a big believer in the power of science, the power of public policy working together to better our environment, our economy, and the, the uh, people that depend on those, all of us. So, um, also, Dr. Bernie has uh, uh, moved uh, towards attention on food security. And we can imagine with drought and the problems that we face, that that's a big issue. We had a lot of people out of jobs the last couple of years in California because of the drought, a lot of uh, impact on food supply. We're not very poor when it comes to food, but in the big picture, it's a big issue. And also climate adaptation strategies to help us deal with those issues. So uh, thank you for being here tonight. And then I'm very pleased to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Dan Kahn, a researcher at Scripps Institution of Oceanography I've been able to work with for about a decade now. And a lot of what you'll see that I present has some of its roots in Dan's uh, advice and guidance and experience. His background is in oceanography. He's uh, a PhD from uh, UC San Diego and is here now at Scripps as a, a long-standing researcher of, of very high esteem in the organization. And I'm developing a center for Western Weather and Water Extremes, our nerdy nickname is CW3E. And, uh, <laughs> and Dan has been a great advisor and participated in that, participant in that, so thank you, Dan. Uh, he also played a really critical role in one of the hallmarks of California's innovative culture. And that is when the state recognized, came to recognize the potential challenges of a changing climate and some of the issues that that could generate. They looked to leadership, political leadership in the state, looked to a set of experts across California and to come together in a consensus way and present a scientific, technically-based projection of what, might be, uh, what the state might be facing when it comes to changes in climate. And uh, Dan Kahn, as everybody I've talked to involved with it, helped lead the charge on that. And that report, ended up advising Arnold Schwarzenegger prior to the passage of the bill that is so important to our state's uh, climate positions. may not be the most popular position from other perspectives, but it's clearly the, one of the most well-informed. So thank you, Dan, for being here as well. I'd like to switch now into uh, a few moments of remarks that I'll make, and the panelists have asked if they could sit in the front seat to see the material as well. I think that's very fair to do, so if you guys want to do that. Anna, could you help transition to the next slide? recently from Duke University, also learning the benefits of Southern California. <laughs> so I'm going to share with you here uh, for a few minutes some experience we've gained scientifically and practically when it comes to water in California. And in particular, I want to share work on something called atmospheric rivers, which really drive a lot of the water supply in, in the western U.S., in particular California, and also uh, can be a cause of flooding if circumstances are uh, such that we've had too much rain beforehand. Also, the information we're developing and the people we're working with uh, in, in uh, water management uh, have uh, interest in seeing whether or not we could use information on atmospheric rivers to help inform future reservoir operations. And that's a very challenging problem because in the state of California and many places in the West, our reservoirs uh, really are multi-purpose. And, and not every one of them, but many of them serve the purpose for water supply we so depend on. But also in the winter when we have flood risk, they are kept at relatively low levels so that if there's a big storm and a flood, the reservoir can absorb some of that flow and therefore take the crest off the flood downstream. And it turns out this isn't just a, a, a small problem. Uh, it turns out Sacramento, for example, uh, is if there was a major flood, could be under 15 feet of water in downtown Sacramento. 
It was determined by the National Academy of Sciences studies uh, prior to Katrina that it was vulnerable to a nearly $100 billion disaster. And at the time, it was sort of, oh, that's way too big. We must be doing something wrong. And the very next year, you know, must be doing something wrong in terms of estimating the risk. The very next year is when Hurricane Katrina hit. Suddenly, it became very clear that those flood risks are profound and uh, serious. And in fact, the U.S. Geological Survey organized a program to study, uh, how would they call it, a uh, emergency preparedness scenario around a flood. And it turned into a very uh, important study that showed what the vulnerability is statewide. It turns out those storms are atmospheric river storms, and hence the USGS program termed their whole study uh, the ARC storm, as in AR for atmospheric river, K for yet to be determined index, and storm, ARC storm. And they found $700 billion worth of risk in California alone. Three times the risk of the big one of an earthquake hitting Southern California. So when we think of water right now, where we are today in the climate of California, it's about not having enough. But in the turn of a dime, it could switch the other direction. And just as an example, if we look to Australia, they had their mega drought that went on for year after year after year. And guess what happened the next year? They had a thousand year flood. So the climate we live in is vulnerable to large variations, and we're benefiting from the science of understanding atmospheric rivers. So let me go ahead here and show how unique California is in particular when it comes to variability. This chart, I won't go into detail, shows how variable the rainfall is from year to year in different places in the country. A place like Michigan, where I'm from, maybe plus or minus 10% from year to year would be considered a big change. In the middle part of the country, I lived in Boulder, Colorado area for 20 years, the yellow dots, it's like plus or minus 20%. Look at California, those green and blue dots are plus or minus 20, 30, even 40 and 50%. So Mother Nature has delivered to California the most variable hydroclimate in the nation. And one of the challenges we face in this region is that the tools and methods developed in science and engineering that serve the east and center part of the country well don't necessarily meet our needs. And it turns out these atmospheric rivers are key to that. And I'll come back to that in a moment. This is a study that shows a bit why that variability from year to year happens the way it does so much in California relative to elsewhere. This study is by Mike Dettinger and Dan Kahn, one of our panelists. And it shows in the black curve over the course of a century, this is 100 years of observations of precipitation in the really important watersheds of the Sacramento and San Joaquin Rivers in Northern California. They provide a lot of the water, some of which we have in our system here in San Diego. That variability, you can see the black curve goes up and down, is a big challenge for our water management system. And it turns out that if you look at what causes that variability, the red curve tells us what we need to know largely. It says that the top few wettest days every year if you add up how much precipitation they contribute, that red curve shows how much. And see how it goes up and down a lot? And the green curve is the 95% of the other days where we have a little bit of rain. They don't add, they add up to about as much, but that 95% sort of is the same from year to year. It's those really wet days that vary from year to year. It turns out that 85% of the interannual variability in California, Northern California precipitation, is because of the few wettest days each year and how they vary from year to year. We've come to learn that most of those big wet days are these atmospheric river days, and they're on average about 10 of them per year in Northern California, with each atmospheric river on average lasting about a day. So think of it being that 10 big storms, each lasting about a day, on average, provide much of the water supply, about half the water supply for Northern California, which of course benefits us immensely. So as those vary from year to year, then scopes drought or flood. They also produce flood. I'm going to speed up a little bit here. That colorful image on the left there is of satellite data showing water vapor in the atmosphere. And that green and orange and red, that represents wet area. And you see how it's lined up from southwest to northeast in California. That's what we call an atmospheric river. That's the signature of it in satellite data. And the dots on land show that the stream flow is really large on those days. And this was the first paper to show that. It turns out that in the western US, ARs are responsible for much of the flooding. 
And the diagram in the lower right from a nice paper by Denger et al. Those green dots show that about 40 to 50 percent of the annual precipitation over a decade came with these roughly 10 atmospheric river events per year. Punchline ARs can both cause floods and provide valuable water supply. This is a diagram from a Scientific American article by Dendra and Ingram that shows a schematic view of it. Imagine you're in space looking down on California, you see the San Francisco Bay there, and this ribbon of air, this moisture riding up over the mountains. That process of the air being pushed along by the atmospheric river, hitting the mountains and causing rain and snow, really drives a lot of our water supply and flood risk. And the idea of that diagram is partly that they're fairly narrow regions, just a few hundred kilometers wide. On the right, the yellow area shows where atmospheric rivers are important for precipitation in the west. The star there shows the Russian River area in Northern California, I'll sp speak about in a moment, where we're doing a lot of study about what's going on there in terms of ARs and how that could be used potentially in the reservoir operations. I'll skip through this a bit. It's a, a fascinating watershed. Um, and this diagram on the right I want to highlight uh, shows on the horizontal axis uh, uh, the annual uh, one-year period from October to September. And the vertical axis is water storage in this reservoir called Lake Mendocino. That reservoir provides water for 600,000 people and also uh, uh, supports the uh, endangered salmon recovery efforts in the region, as well as the grape industry. I don't know if anybody likes wine from Sonoma, but it comes out of this reservoir to a degree. That curve on the right, that diagram, which is quite complicated, I just want to step through for a moment. The storage levels there uh, are shown in the, uh, in the vertical axis. Uh, basically, the red line is what happened in 2012, and you saw, we saw a big two atmospheric rivers hit in December, and they filled the reservoir into that space where they're supposed to keep it empty a bit for, uh, for uh, flood control. The allowable water in the reservoir is the dashed black line, which dips down in the winter to allow for that flood control role. And because of that, they let the water go, that red line peaks and then drops off. That was because they released it to get it back to where it was supposed to be by rules. And then, lo and behold, the drought began, which nobody knew was coming. And it turned out, our, our, uh, we formed a group of experts who are now asking the question, could we have done something different with that water? It turns out reservoir operations largely aren't allowed to use forecast information because when they were built years ago, uh, forecasts weren't really very good, and they were allowed to use water information when the water was in the rain gauge, in the stream gauge, or on, in the res reservoir itself. Now we're introducing the idea of using forecasts. Forecasts of what? Largely forecasts of these atmospheric rivers because they represent the flood risk. The reason they drained that water out was because if another AR had hit, they would have been in a serious flood problem. So you see the idea here is instead of draining it all, we keep, say, 10,000 acre feet. And that would then carry over with that dashed green line into the dry season and allow for additional water supply. As you see in the note there, that could be as much as uh, water for 20,000 households for a year. This is not a small amount of water. This is a big deal in the area. And we're using this watershed as a, as a test bed sort of a pilot study. We formed up a team of experts, including the Army Corps of Engineers, Sonoma County Water Agency, California Department of Water Resources, NOAA, USGS, and the Bureau of Reclamation co-chaired by myself and the chief engineer uh, for Sonoma County Water Agency. And we're working hard to figure out and assess whether or not it would be viable for us to use forecasts of ARs to help operate the reservoir. One of the, role, one of the challenges there is to figure out how much lead time we need uh, to predict these ARs to, in order to be useful. <coughs> this is an analysis led by Dr. Scott Sellers, who uh, is hosting and helping co-host this event. And it's supported by our project by uh, uh, FIRO, we call it Forecast Informed Reservoir Operations. Bottom line is, about five days lead time would allow enough time for the water to be released from the reservoir and then to travel downstream past the flood uh, risk point of Guerneville. And five days lead time is what we're working on right now. I'm getting behind, so I'm going to speed up here. Forecasts of precipitation are tough. Forecasts of where atmospheric rivers make landfall is tough in terms of specific. Here we see a graph with the forecast lead time on the horizontal axis and root mean square error of where the AR hits the coast uh, on the vertical axis. And I've highlighted at 500, at five days lead time, it's about plus or minus 500 kilometers. The whole Russian River watershed is only 130 kilometers across. So that's just not good enough yet. 
But that challenge represents the drive for a lot of research and science here at UC San Diego, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and with other universities around the state and elsewhere. <clears throat> One of the things we're doing is looking at better observations offshore, and this is a map of uh, AR that hit uh, last winter, and the black lines there are where we flew the Air Force C-130 aircraft uh, and sampled the atmospheric rivers with the special drop sounds that drop from the aircraft, little parachute, takes about 20 minutes to fall, radios back all the details that we need to know about water vapor and wind and pressure and temperature, and then we send that into the forecast models. I'm gonna skip this one. Let's just say the, the right-hand panel there, the fact that all those little thumb, thumbnails are different says that the forecast became very uncertain a few days out. I'd like to highlight that we have a, if you're interested in atmospheric river information or FIRO, uh, you can take a look at our center's website, cw3e.ucsd.edu. Uh, and I'll just give you a little hint of what's coming over the next few days. We have a diagram here that shows that those red blobs are basically a forecast of atmospheric rivers hitting Northern California over the next three days. Uh, there's one hitting tonight. There's one over the weekend. And there's an interesting thing potentially out there over the next two days after that. The fact that those are all lined up around San, Diego, uh, San Francisco tells me that the uh, HU must be coming. Sorry, that's an inside joke for scientists. It's always wet at <laughs> our annual meeting in San Francisco. So I'll close with that. And we're going to go ahead to the next uh, panelist. And then after the panelists are done, Anna, if you could change it. After the panelists are done, we'll have time for discussion and questions. Thank you. part of this discussion. I'm very honored to have the opportunity to speak before you today and talk about the San Diego County region and how we've lived with uh, drought conditions, um, how we believe we will continue to live with drought conditions and what we've done um, to address it. So just to tell you a little bit about the San Diego County Water Authority, we're a wholesaler. We were created by the state legislature in 1944. Uh, we serve 3.3 million people in San Diego County and support a $222 billion economy. We have 24 member agencies, um, so we are the uh, wholesaler and we serve water to the retail agencies, the 24 member agencies. Um, 80 to 90 percent of our water, depending on the year, is imported into San Diego County. But not only do we import water, we build, own, operate, and maintain large-scale uh, regional infrastructure, um, as well as uh, having invested in new sources of supply, including the most recently completed and operational uh, desalination project, the largest in North America, um, built here in San Diego County. So this is a chart showing back to uh, early uh, 1900s, and I know it's very hard to see, it's not the eye test this evening, but I'll tell you just, uh, if you take a look at the colors, it shows that uh, the dark blue is when it's wet, and the red and yellow is when it's uh, dry and critically dry. And what you see from this is over time that droughts are very common in California. Um, the last time the amount of precipitation served this region was 1946. So we are an arid uh, region, um, one that has been used to um, and will continue to experience droughts. Um, part of our story is that we're at the very end of a, at the end of a very long pipeline. Um, the Water Authority uh, gets its water from uh, the state project about 20%, Colorado River about 64%, and local uh, supply development um, of about 16%. It's very important to note that we are at the end of a very long pipeline. The fact that we experience droughts 
regularly. We need to make sure that we as a region are self-sufficient and that we have supply reliability. In 1991, 95% uh, of our source of water came from one source, and that was Metropolitan uh, Water District. Um, and during the late 80s, early 90s, when there was a severe drought, um, we uh, were told that we would lose about 50% of our supply, and it really created a lot of concern and worry. Um, and we didn't know what we were going to do. And these were some of the headlines um, throughout the newspapers in the early 90s. And some of you may have been in San Diego during this time and remember um, the talk about the drought and the cut. And so our uh, board of directors, the business community, uh, the residents um, came together and said, we do not want to be faced with this again. Now the good news is that there was something called the Miracle March where it rained and rained and rained. Um, I'm sure it was an AR is my guess. Um, and we ended up only losing about 30% of our supply for 13 months. But to this region that depends on water to help its economy and have the quality of life that we enjoy here was quite severe. And so we came together and we said we never want to be in that situation again. So what did we do? We focused in several areas. Uh, one is that back to 1990, uh, we had a focus on conservation. In 1990, our per capita use uh, was 235 gallons per person per day. We've had a 40% decline in our water usage since that time. And in 2015, that per capita use was down to 143 gallons per day. Uh, the last bar chart that you see on the right says 167 gallons per day, which is what the current um, state legislation says that we must achieve, so we're below that level. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few moments because there's a lot happening at the state uh, with regard to draft framework um, and what the future will hold. So we focused on the use, the demand for uh, water and reducing that demand. And then we went and focused on increasing the pie. Just like your own investments, you would not rely on one investment category to make sure that you had a healthy financial portfolio for your retirement. The same thing applies to water. We needed to look at diversifying our portfolio. And so we took about to invest and um, ensure that we have new supplies. So from 1991, where we were 95% dependent on Metropolitan Water District, in 2016, we estimate only 41% of our water will come from that single source. And the reason that that is, is because we um, look to uh, diversify and invest, and I'll talk about those investments. By 2020, um, as you see, that pie um, shrinks to about 21% coming from Metropolitan Water District, and in 2035, it goes down to about 13%. And so you see that no one source of supply, um, whether it be from Metropolitan, um, our agreement with Imperial Irrigation District, recycled water, potable water, seawater desalination, uh, we're not majorly dependent on one single source so that if we lose a source of supply, we have backup. So how did we create reliability through diversification? It was really employing uh, a diverse uh, focus on a number of strategies um, and dealing with our local conditions. Um, we took a multifaceted approach, as I said, conservation, we invested in new um, supplies, both imported and local, and we invested in infrastructure. The cornerstone of our investment started with the what's called the uh, qu uh, Quantification Settlement Agreement, and it's an agreement with Imperial Irrigation District to transfer for 45 to 75 years um, 100,000 acre feet of water, and it grants up to 200,000 acre feet by 2021. Um, that water is uh, provided through on-farm conservation um, and is transferred from Imperial Irrigation District to um, the San Diego County area. In addition, we were realigned to urban canals, both the Coachella and the um, American Canal, and the water that was saved that didn't seep into the ground through having um, a concrete-lined canal 
um, then uh, resulted in 80,000 acre feet of additional water, which again is transferred to San Diego region. And that agreement is for 110 years. Our supply of water uh, from these sources comes um, through the Imperial Irrigation, which gets their water directly from the Colorado River, and they have one of the highest levels of um, priority rights of any agency that takes water off of um, the Colorado River. And in 2020, this quantification settlement agreement will account for 46% of our region's supply of water. We also made historic investments into infrastructure. Uh, we did the largest dam raise in the world, uh, roller compacted dam raise at San Vicente Dam, which was completed um, in uh, July of 2014. Uh, we raised the dam um, to be able to store additional water, as was uh, pointed out by um, Dr. Ralph, it's important to have um, not only the rain coming but or the water available, but to have some place to store it so when you need it in later times you can have access to it. We also, um, again, invested in the relining of the canals. Um, we uh, relined our pipe, our old pipe, to ensure that we didn't have leakage. Uh, we created a pump um, storage project to provide energy um, and uh, also built the Olivetine <coughs> Dam and Reservoir. We have invested $3.2 billion in San Diego County over the last 20 years, which has helped us to achieve our reliability. And the most recent source of new supply for the region is the Carlsbad Desalination Project. Um, it provides up to 56,000 acre feet of water to this region, which is drought proof, not subject to the vagaries of Sacramento or Washington, D.C., um, controlled here locally, not worried if there's an emergency and there's a pipeline break due to an earthquake, it's here locally. It represents about 10% of our supply needed to serve the entire um, San Diego County region. Um, and lastly, I'd like to just talk briefly about the fact that, um, as I mentioned, we had invested in storage. And through the state regulations and the governor's executive order requiring in the last year that we reduce the amount of water that we're using, regardless of the amount of supplies that we have, um, we had water that we could not use. And so just in time when the dam was completed, we had the ability to put water into storage. We were able to store 100,000 acre feet of water. We had anticipated originally it would take us four to five years to fill that storage. We filled it in 18 months. So that carryover storage is available in the event that we have a reduction in supply. And uh, our board of directors approved today to utilize that supply in the case of a drought over a equal increments over a five year period of time, helping to blunt um, any one particular year of uh, reduced water uh, availability. Um, we also have um, emergency storage, um, about 34,000 acre feet of water um, to store in emergency, and that's also if there, for instance, there's a earthquake that um, damages one of the pipelines and we're not able to get access to water um, from Northern California. So again, a multi-pronged approach to ensure that we have water here in San Diego County. Um, what I think is um, interesting to note is to take a look back um, in the early 1990s um, and where we are versus 2015 um, and how things have changed. Um, and 1990 is the year before we had the cutbacks from Metropolitan Water District. Um, and we used at that time 641,000 acre feet of water in this county. In 2015, we only used 570,000 acre feet of water. The region's potable water use, um, which is shown in blue, is 21% lower than it was 25 years ago. But between 1990 and 2015, the population of San Diego County, as many of you I'm sure can attest, has grown 33%. Um, 
and our job base grew by 34%. Um, our economy grew by 91% over that same period of time. But as you will see, reliability has come at a cost, and that cost is um, increased rates to the rate payers. Um, and there is a balance um, to having that reliability as um, versus um, the cost of it, and finding that balance is critical. The last slide I'd like to leave you with is what we call um, adaptive management, and it's something called um, managing with a no regrets strategy. And so we look at various projects, we look at demand over a long period of time. This particular chart goes out to 2030. Um, we're planning um, uh, our next increment of supply is going to come from potable reuse. Uh, the largest of those projects is the City of San Diego's Pure Water Project that will provide 100,000 acre feet of water when it's complete, uh, about 100,000. Um, and several other agencies um, in the county are working on that. But in the event that for some reason that doesn't go forward or other projects um, of that nature don't go forward. We have, um, we're looking at um, potential, um, only an idea of a possible Camp Pendleton desal plan. Um, and because it takes so long to plan and, and develop those projects, Carlsbad took 14 years, um, we're doing just some initial studies. Um, and we have drop-off points that um, if certain things happen, um, we will not move forward. If things do happen and the environment changes, we have the ability to move forward. So I uh, leave you with that. I um, look forward to having the opportunity to answer any questions about what we're doing here in San Diego County. Thank you. that California is a great place to be for a million reasons, uh, of course, but also because it's a really great place to study this set of dynamics. Um, and I'd like to use my time today uh, to give a rapid overview of how California agriculture actually fits into the water picture. So California is a agricultural region for the country uh, and indeed uh, for the world. Uh, we are the largest agricultural producing state in the country by a large margin. Um, total farm output is about $50 billion, it's been a little bit less recently because of the drought. Um, this is about 11% of the national total. Um, in crops, we're about 15%, 7% or 8% in national receipts for livestock and animal products. So in addition to being uh, just a, a major producer, California is also uh, a different producer than the other main agricultural regions uh, in the United States. We grow more than 350 different crops here, um, and if the Midwest and the High Plains are the breadbasket of the country, uh, we're more like the salad bowl and the smoothie shop. Um, so this is a map of California land cover. Um, and then you can see uh, the dominant production region, the Central Valley, um, all the beautiful speckled colors there, uh, both north and south of the Sacramento uh, River Delta. Um, for example, uh, this blue here, uh, north of the Delta, is uh, land devoted to rice production. Um, uh, over here, uh, you can see the, the grapes of Napa and Sonoma. Um, also further south in the Salinas area, where you also see some pink strawberries um, <clears throat> that we all know and love. Uh, these teal and green tree orchards are for almonds and pistachios all along the Central Valley. Uh, and then closer to home for us, you can see the Imperial Irrigation District, where the um, main output south of the salt and sea are alfalfa, other kinds of hay and sugar beets, and then some broccoli uh, and other vegetables north of there. Um, you know, we produce 99% uh, or more, so essentially all of 
the countries, almonds, walnuts, and pistachios, prunes, kiwis, artichokes, dates, figs, um, a, a majority of the avocados, as, as we know very locally here. Um, and uh, all told, it's about 60% of US fruit and vegetable production, and we also produce 20% of the country's milk. So it's just a very different uh, landscape uh, in terms of production uh, than the rest of the country. And, um, you know, I think probably anecdotally we all know why as, as Californians, either native or transplanted, um, you know, we hear a lot about uh, microclimates, right? And so if we do produce a lot of these niche crops. And if, for example, you look at this Fres the Fresno area here, um, you can better see the existence of these, uh, these very small suitability regions. So again, the gray is the urban extent, so sort of the greater Fresno area. Purple, you've got a lot of grapes. Again, the teal and bright green are um, almonds and pistachios. The red is actually cotton, and um, you've got oranges and citrus over here um, on the east. Um, uh, what's really, uh, one other thing I want to draw is this, this sort of putty color on the left is actually fallowed land. And that's actually gotten a lot bigger in the past few years with the drought. Um, but what's really amazing is if you look back in time five years or six years to 2010, um, you can see a very different landscape. Um, so here I'm going to show you what this looked like in 2010. Um, and of course, the urban extent is smaller. Um, but you also see much larger areas devoted to, uh, you see the pink and the red are alfalfa and cotton. Big field crops. And this has been a really important trend um, across California in the past five years. Um, so 2010, 2011 was, was a good rain year, but since then obviously we've had, um, we've had drought. Uh, but, but with that happening, we've nevertheless seen something that might be counterintuitive, which is a move um, away from field crops, where in a given year you can adjust how much you plant uh, more easily into orchard crops and, and perennial crops. So these are really big fixed assets in the ground, and they're crops that actually require steady water year to year. Right, but as we've been hearing about um, from Marty and then the more local San Diego perspective in San Diego, that's not how California hydrology works. Right, we have the biggest hydrological variability in the country. That's this, you know, the, the rainbow dots. We were standing out there, so we are increasingly producing um, uh, important uh, high-value crops that require uh, regular water supply, and, and that's not something that we uh, we specialize in. Um, so. Uh, As Marty said, we get a lot of precipitation in the north and in the Sierras. And then, uh, as a state, we've got a lot of infrastructure devoted to trying to manage and spread that resources around, resource around. So Sandy brought this out. We're at you know, the very, uh, bottom, very end of the road, as it were. Um, so it's really important for us to think about that locally. Um, but, but really, it's a statewide issue. Right, so here you see all the natural rivers and bodies of water in blue, and then our huge system of canals uh, in green, which are trying to do this geographic and temporal smoothing within a given year. Um, you know, and um, in this next map on the right, we have a, a sort of more detailed map of the stocks and flows on average in the system. So now you can see where uh, we've got um, uh, reservoirs, hydro facilities, um, and sort of an, an understanding of the scales and flows going on here. Um, some, of, some of this set of water transfers is for hydropower, some is for municipal use, uh, and of course much of it is for agriculture. So of the water that is used in California, um, typically between 60% in a really wet year to 8% uh, is for agriculture. Uh, so nobody's said this so far, so I feel like pedagogically compelled to do this, which is we, we always talk about water in acre feet. Um, and so I just want to make sure a thousand acre feet or a million acre feet. Uh, I just want everyone to make sure that we know that uh, a, the, an acre foot is the amount, the volume of water that would cover an acre of land to a depth of one foot. Uh, it's a lot of water, right? It's just under 326,000 gallons. So uh, we toss this number around because it's more tr more tractable, but it's a lot of water. Um, in a given year, uh, we get uh, about 80 million acre feet or so in precipitation. Um, about half of that, you know, stays in our water system. Uh, half or a little bit more, uh, we withdraw uh, in some way. And about 25 or so million acre feet uh, we use for irrigated agriculture, which covers something like uh, nearly 30 million acres. Um, for comparison, uh, 
California is about 11% of, of total national water withdrawals. If you look at the you know, sort of national total, we're about 11% of that. When you think about all purposes, but when it comes to irrigation water use, we're 20% of the national total. Right? And again, this is we're producing a very different set of things here. Um, so, uh, you know, of course, as we've heard tonight, uh, California has high hydrological variability, um, but ever more constant demands um, <coughs> the sh shift in crop production. And so, one thing that uh, we know is happening is that there's a lot of uh, supplementation of this surface water with groundwater withdrawals. Um, it, that amount varies year to year, of course, basically in response to the natural hydrological variability uh, in our surface water supply. Um, but typically, irrigation is uh, our irrigation water is 30 to 50 percent groundwater. Um, that's a big uncertainty, and I'll explain to you why. Um, but it depends on the year. The trouble is, we don't actually know how much groundwater we use. Um, uh, farmers have not been required to report private pumping levels, um, pumping amounts, excuse me. So um, to date, the best we can do is really estimate water demands based on what's planted. Uh, my research group does this um, using a water model uh, that helps, uh, that takes into account precipitation and what kind of crops are planted, really what the land cover is, something like that first map that I showed you, um, and uh, estimates the sustainable water yield, which could either be groundwater or surface water. Um, we then also model consumption as a function of whatever is being grown. Um, and then the difference between this yield and consumption gives you an estimate of the water that would be needed in addition, so irrigation water that would need to be added. Um, if you subtract out something about known surface water transfers, which we do know something a little bit more about, um, then you can infer the amount of groundwater that might need to be pumped in a given year. Um, it's not perfect, and we're working on a lot of different methods, including um, some remote sensing uh, based techniques, but it's really the best that we can do at present. And what we find really is, here's an example of looking at Fresno County. Um, in the blue, you have uh, water yield uh, for the county, and in the red, you have water demand. Uh, and what you can see, um, this is plotted uh, in a slightly interesting way, which is that zero is actually the 2000, uh, 1980 to 2010 average. And then we've got 2010, each of the individual years um, since 2010 plotted sort of relative to that average where they fell. So 2010, again, was wetter. And then, of course, we have our drought years all to the left, sort of less than average. But, but the takeaway from this is that uh, you know, on an, even on an average year, um, demand exceeds supply, and that's all the more so when we're having a dry year. Um, you know, this, this indicates that we need to think about uh, not only smoothing water availability geographically within a given year, but also about doing this intertemporally between years. So when we have a really wet year, we need to think about how we can recharge aquifers, how we might store when we have excess, right? And we've talked about a lot of the surface network, but thinking about that for groundwater too. Um, I've been talking about this use of water for food, um, but in California, of course, um, we actually have three very tightly connected systems, our food system, our water system, and our energy system. We've alluded to all of them today. Um, each of these, uh, shown here as rows, is actually used in or impacts uh, the other system, shown as columns. Um, and so this is, a, this is an intricate web, and one of the things that we've realized is especially important here in California is that you can't think about these things in pairs or just in terms of one affecting the other. Um, we really need to think about the entire system. Um, each of these systems is under stress on its own, both from climate change uh, and uh, his, historical climate change to date, and also our state's climate uh, mitigation targets. Uh, I think that Dan's going to talk about this a little bit more in a minute. So we really need to understand uh, these systems jointly to help chart a path forward uh, because there are going to be conflicts. Um, thinking about hydropower is one example of you know, what, what do we need to do with, uh, with water as, as constraints get tighter. Um, we have a really vibrant research team here between my group here at, and at UC Irvine and Davis trying to model this for the whole state, but really the idea is that hopefully this is something that we can think about then also as uh, a national kind of thing. All right, um, I'm going to leave off there, and hopefully I have uh, teed it up well for Dan. Awesome. Thanks.
so uh, I'm going to bring this home, and, and then we'll have a free for all. Uh, so let me go to the end, because I'll run out of time. So uh, what, I, what I wanted, what I'd like to do is just uh, give you a sort of little roadmap of where, what I wanted to say, and uh, what I see as some, some needs that I think have already been um, emphasized here. So first of all, we're in an area that's um, really exquisitely variable uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, our water supply, is, as Marty uh, made the point, is, is really highly dependent on uh, individual events, just a handful of them. Whether we get them, whether we don't, kind of makes the difference. Um, Climate change has already, <coughs> already been quite uh, significantly determined that it is present and uh, we think it's quite likely, very likely to increase. Uh, precipitation changes in California are unsettled, um, but as you go farther south, the um, evidence from the, the latest generation of models is towards getting drier. So um, Southern California, Mexico, Western Mexico uh, look, look uh, drier than our historical climate. Um, and of course, climate change will impact us in, in many ways. Uh, multiple systems. Jen has made the point of how uh, water, energy, food are interlinked, and um, similarly, uh, these impacts will cascade and affect simultaneously a lot of things. So, what do we need uh, in, in looking forward? Well, we need to we need to keep track of what's going on. That's the only way that uh, we know where we are, and we can train uh, our our uh, models and so forth to look into the future. Um, Marty made the point of the, the real strong importance of developing better forecasts at, um, I think, relatively short ranges, but um, that can be taken out to decades uh, in, in, in turn. Um, I think that uh, we all know that in order to adapt, uh, we're going to need um, institutional and social changes, the way, the way people think. Um, we uh, need more storage. Sandy really emphasized that. And storage can come in a lot of different forms, whether it's built storage or storage in aquifers. Uh, Broadening our water portfolios at uh, San Diego County Water Authority is a poster child for that and will continue to be, I think. Um, conservation, of course, is important. Saving water saves energy, saves uh, emissions into the atmosphere. And, of course, we need education, which you know we're all participating in. So I have another two minutes. And um, let me just go back and, and uh, just go quickly. Uh, this, I don't have to remind this is an annual uh, record of our precipitation. So it's not quite as brilliant as what Sandy showed, but um, you'll notice, again, the uh, tremendous ups and downs of the system, uh, a point that, that Marty made. Um, in recent years, we've, we've actually had three waves of drought um, that have been uh, increasingly intense here in, in California, and uh, kind of the jury's out whether this is, is uh, recovering or whether it's continuing. We have a mild La Nina this year, and generally that's not so good for Southern California. It's kind of a um, you know, 
some good, some not so good in, in Northern California, which is the water bearing area, as well as the Colorado Basin, which is really important for our, uh, our water. Um, this is a really interesting chart, uh, which shows a combination of reservoir storage, that's the blue shades here. This is a time series beginning in 1970 uh, through current, uh, put together by our friend and colleague, Mike Dettinger. Um, and uh, the little uh, hair-like filigree on the top in green is the amount that's stored in the snowpack, which is um, we've used in the West as a, an extra reservoir. It has the properties uh, that we need in terms of reservoir storage. It fills up in the winter, and then it, it uh, delivers in the warm season after in our Mediterranean system, storms have died down. We don't have to worry about flood control because remember our, our reservoir system that Marty was talking about are, are dual purpose. They're used to store water and to withhold floods. Uh, so the interesting thing about this is that um, essentially both systems, the natural system and the built system kind of oscillates uh, up and down together as, as, the, as we uh, are deprived of precipitation, we start really draining down our aquifers. Uh, and of course, uh, especially in the last couple of years, the snowpack was just, um, it was outstandingly low. And uh, that was both because we had low precipitation, but we also had um, just unworldly warm temperatures in the last couple of years. Um, Jen made this point. This is an estimate from a model that's run over the Central Valley of California, the, the uh, sort of um, big salad bowl, I guess, in California. And um, what this uh, model estimate shows is that the, this is the, the chart at the, the top left, as you're looking here, um, you see that the groundwater aquifer levels are going up and down, but they're um, sort of monotonically almost going down as we go in the future. So we are using water really uns unsustainably. And uh, the, uh, although groundwater has been used to uh, mitigate drought, the question of whether we're going to be able to continue to use that as a strategy as we go forward uh, could be compromised. Um, you've seen that already. This is a record of temperature in, in uh, Southern California. You can see how it's, it's gone up after the mid-70s. Um, this is looking into the future, which really dwarfs what we've seen historically. So we're seeing the dotted line here is three degrees Celsius. That's about five degrees Fahrenheit uh, average uh, temperature as we go forward. Um, this is in July uh, for model, from model simulations looking forward. Um, just to give you a little cartoon of what a July day might look like in the future, <coughs> here's today. Um, this is the Southern California complex and um, here's mid-century. So the, the color shadings <coughs> are, are uh, intuitive. Um, red is hot. Scott, I got you. You don't have to keep waving that flag at me. I understand that. <laughs> I'm almost done. Uh, and this is the, the future. So with that warming, of course, comes lots of, of impacts. Um, precipitation changes get harsher in the core of the uh, subtropical descending cells uh, around the globe. The Mediterranean systems are all in, in uh, trouble. Um, this guy sitting in the audience there, Douglas Alden, uh, wondering about the California snowpack uh, as he looks up into um, the uh, Taiga Pass area. And uh, we think we're probably uh, due to lose at least half of our snowpack in the spring the water contained by it um, by the end of the century. And that's probably if we're lucky under um, these climate scenarios. 
We're getting we're going to have drier summer landscapes. So in, in a sense, our climates here in the West are going to get more intense seasonally. We're going to go from swings of winters that are still rather moist, but um, pretty dry landscapes. Those dry landscapes uh, and uh, those low snow years have been years where we've seen um, the real the real intense wildfire years in the West. So um, I will, uh, I got to my to my summary and I'll, I already said it, so I'll, I'll get off and uh, we can, uh, we can <laughs> open it up. Thank you.